All right, well, we are in our last week of Hidden Assumptions, and this whole series is about idols. And if you haven't been with us for the whole time, then let me just kind of give you the, the overview of what this whole series is about. Basically, um, an idol, as we would define it, is anything that we put above God. So anything that, that has our heart's affection, our heart's attention, that, that demands our obedience over God. Um, I want that you know, guy or that girl over God. I want um, that success over God. I want you know, safety, comfort. I want um, the well-being of my family over the will of God. And so basically... Um, as the Bible would define it, or as we would come to know it, um, an idol is anything that we put above God. But the trick about idols is you can't simply remove them because they serve a need. There is something deep down that if you were to kind of take everything that you would look at that would compete with your affection for God, at its core, there's a need that it serves. And so when we try to just remove those things out of our life, the trouble is, is that they just tend to seep back and seep back and seep back in. And so what ends up happening is if we don't realize what need that idol serves, we will continually fall back into that idolatry. And so we've talked about a bunch of different things, and every week there are some that are, um, I think, more pointed for some of us. There's some that are more pointed for others of us. For some of us, when we talked about success, you're like, man, that's my thing. And achievement, you're like, that's my thing. For some of us, when we talked about relationships, you're like, that's my thing. You know, kind of wherever you are in life, you know, a lot of that is determined by that. But today, we're going to talk about something that I think no one walked in the room thinking I struggle with this, but we all do. It is a silent idol. In fact, it is fairly pervasive with all idols. That is to say, the idol that we're going to talk about today is something that no one walked in. In fact, I'm going to tell you what it is at first, and you're going to probably disagree for a little bit. But none of us walked in who followed Jesus thinking, this is my struggle. But I think every single one of us struggle with it. And it is simply put, the idol of emotions. The idol of our emotions. Now, I don't know that anyone walked into the room again thinking, man, I just struggle because I idolize my emotions, right? It's like, man, you know, when I just break down and have a good cry, you know, I just put that above God in my life. You know, that reigns supreme on the throne of my life is how I feel. Which I think is, it makes sense intellectually. But let me ask you this. If you're a Christian, you know those times, you know those times when like you're, you feel like every time you open the Bible, it's like, it's like angels are speaking to you, right? You were probably at camp when it happened, granted. Um, you know, but you were at the beach, and you're like, oh, my God, as an artist, as you look at this sunset, you know, and you just happen to have this crush, and you guys are kind of like, you know, hey, 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 babe. You know, and, and, and you were sitting next to each other, and you were reading your Bible, and you, you read the Psalms, and you're like, oh, my God, my God, you know, or my guy. You know, you kind of you get those two confused, but, right, you you think that, and when that happens, this isn't this true, when that happens, like, we get to the point where we feel like we would do anything for God. Worship night, man, we're just like, God, everything, you know? <clears throat> and then the next morning, we didn't get enough sleep, and we're like, God, like, a third of what I said yesterday. Let me ask you this. If you're a Christian, and you have followed Jesus for a while, do you follow Jesus less when you are in a season where it's the opposite? Where you feel like, man, I read and I just don't feel like God is speaking to me. I pray and I just don't feel like God is speaking to me clearly. I feel like I do the things, I go to group, I go to church, I go to worship, and it just doesn't feel like for whatever reason it feels dry and it feels like I'm not connected with God. Isn't this true? Almost every single one of us will follow Jesus and towards our affections and our obedience towards God. Specifically, our obedience towards God is greater in a season of emotional engagement than it is in what feels like spiritual dryness. Here's, here's just simply the point. If an idol is anything that drives our obedience from God into something else, isn't this true? Here's the thing that very few of us want to admit, but we all know it's true. For most of us, our obedience is tied to our emotions. For most of us, our obedience to God is tied to our emotions. How we feel about God, how we feel about what God calls us to do, how we feel about what God says, and how we feel like we will feel if we do what God says. For most of us, our emotions drive our obedience to God. And there's a need that they serve. 
And, and, and again, we all know this. This is why um, they serve a need. And, and if you kind of get down to some of the, the, the basement level of this, our emotions indicate something that's going on in our heart. And when our emotions indicate what's going on in our heart on a, on a functional level, here's what I think happens. I feel a certain type of way that feels against what I know what God would have me to do. And so when my emotions are an indicator, what I have a tendency to do is use my idol to medicate my emotions. So let me give you an example. Some of you are like, all right, I'm feeling this, but I'm not totally on board yet. Bear with me. I feel lonely. And I know, I know that God has called me. I know that God has called me to find the person that also loves him. I know that God has called me the, the husband or to the wife or to the, you know, the, 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 the dating relationship where the person knows Jesus, loves Jesus, honors Jesus, follows Jesus. But right now, I feel lonely. So the indicator of the emotion, the emotion is loneliness, right? And so I feel that. When I feel that, what I do is I use something not honoring to God to medicate that emotion. So I find somebody who doesn't honor God, who doesn't love Jesus, who, who truthfully I would be unequally yoked with. And because of that, it gives me the temporal feeling to medicate the emotion that I have within me. Feeling frustrated, feeling overwhelmed. And so instead of you know, you know, taking it to God or doing whatever, when I feel that emotion, the, the indicator of the emotion or the emotion that indicates is it, is it says overwhelmed, frustrated, whatever it is. And so here's what I do. Instead of, instead of going to God, I just go online and I shop. And there's nothing wrong with online shopping. It's wildly convenient, right? Thank God for Amazon, Jeff Bezos, and two-day shipping. It's like, so don't hear me like downplaying that. But isn't this true? Isn't this true? We will use the idol in our life to medicate the emotion, but the emotion in and of itself, when we medicate it with an idol, it is something that we're choosing above or over God. Yeah. And so we, we see God, we know God, but we don't feel like it right now. And as a result, we follow and do all types of other things. So here's part of the sermon today. I just want to bring you to the awareness that we do it. Right, Half of the battle is just being aware that that's the tendency, that that's mechanically how it works. That when I feel this, I do that. When I feel this, I do that. When I feel this type of way, I go and I do that. I medicate with that one particular type of thing. And the, good, the thing is, is we all have that one particular thing. Right? We all have something in our lives that we have a tendency to feel. With guys, let me tell you when you're most susceptible. And I've learned this acronym a long time ago, and it has helped me so much in life. Um, it's called HALT. When you're hungry, angry, lonely, tired. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. H-A-L-T, in case you didn't know how to spell. Hungry, angry, lonely, tired. HALT, right? When you do that, you're going to have the overwhelming tendency to hungry. That's kind of angry, and they're kind of one and the same, right? Hungry, angry, lonely. Or when you're tired, sometimes you feel lonely too. When you feel those things, you're going to have a heightened tendency to medicate. And we all do this. Every single one of us does this. And the opposite thing that we shouldn't do is to then say, okay, so ignore your emotions. Right? For some of us, that was the problem growing up. Is we felt a certain type of way. And it was that your feeling is not valid. Let me tell you why your feeling is valid. Because your feeling is an indicator that you have a need that's not being met. That somewhere in there, there is something happening inside of you. And so what oftentimes the tendency to say is, say, okay, so shut down your emotions. Well, the entire generation did that before us. And it's not always healthy. In fact, it's not. Become emotionally unavailable, become emotionally distant. All of a sudden, God and the pursuit of God becomes a pursuit that's in total lack of emotion. And so for some of us, what we think about is that Man, I am going to, I am going to just satiate the need and medicate what is indicated in my hearts and my emotions and my affections with whatever idols around. For some of us, we're just like, nope, I'm emotionless. I'm shutting out emotion. And what we find to be true in Scripture is the opposite. In fact, it's neither of those things. It's something that, that most of us rarely do, but I think if we ever did, it would change our relationship with God. 
If you've ever read the Psalms, you know the Psalms. In fact, one summer we um, preached through the Psalms, or we kind of you know, worked all the way through the Psalms, and everybody read, and every week we picked out a song that we read. And, and if you've ever read through all of the Psalms at the same time, which some of you have, and if you've ever especially preached through some of the Psalms, you know like the whole thing is like David's pretty much, or whoever writes the Psalm, it's like a sad boy constantly. It's like, God, my life's awful. God, yep, my life's awful again today. It's like, David, weren't you king? Yep, my life's awful. It's like, come on, come on man, isn't it a little bit better than that? But one of the things that's always so powerful to me about the Psalms is the rawness and the realness of being able to hold two oppositional thoughts and honoring them both at the same time. And this is the theme that we're going to find today. God, you are my rock. And God, I am dying inside. You are my rock, you are true, you are real, you are my hope. And God, this is how I feel. Let me tell you what, the, the whole thing of where we're going with this today. We need to lean, learn to not take our emotions and our thoughts and our idols and hide from God and medicate them in a separate way. But we need to learn to bring how we feel and bring it to the truth of who God is, even if we don't receive reconciliation in our thoughts that day. That might sound a little bit weird. We're going to get there, okay? Follow me. So Psalm chapter 42 is one of my favorite psalms. Psalm chapter 42. <clears throat> Some of you, you've read this kind of first line before, and as you've read it, and this is like a, a super classic church um, song that some of you know. So Psalm chapter 42, verse 1, it says this, So as the deer pants for a stream of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. Some of you guys know that song. Anybody know that song? As the deer Okay, there's like three people who are over 35. I appreciate you in this room. Yeah, as, this, as the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. And oftentimes we read that little verse and we're thinking like, oh, like that's how I want to be. Like, God, I just, like, you imagine kind of like a baby deer, like going to like the, the gentle stream. And you're like, right? You're like, that's, God, that's how I want to long for you as the deer pants for water. He says, verse 2, verse two so my, my soul thirsts for God, for the living God, when, I, when can I go and meet with God? Now, here's kind of the, the uh, understanding of what's happening in this verse. This is most likely not David um, that has, has written this, but as the psalmist or the psalmists have written this, they're in some type of a position where for whatever reason, they can't go to the temple and worship. They can't go and see God. They can't go be with God at the temple. And they're saying, God, there's something inside of me. There's a hole that exists inside of me because I want to be there with you, but I can't be there with you. And right now I am down because of it. So it's not just like, oh, God, and so now let me go read my quiet time on the beach and have my cup of coffee and let me Instagram it. No. He's saying, God, there is something inside of me that wants that. And right now I don't feel like I can have that. And I long for it. So it's left a feeling and a void. Verse 3. So my tears have been my food day and night. While men say to me all day long, where is your God? He says, these things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go with the multitude, leading the procession of the house of God with shouts of joy, thanksgiving among the, the festive throng. And so, why are you downcast, O oh my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Now, I love how he launches into this. He says, life is terrible right now. Like my, my tears... They're like my food because I have cried so much. I mean, it has been such a difficult season of life for me. It has been such a difficult life. And on top of that, on top of the internal struggle I feel, there's the external pressure I feel. There's the, there's the external mocking I feel. There's the external scorn I feel that the people around me are saying, hey, we see how you are. We see how difficult this is for you. So where's God? And then some of us, if we're being honest, that's what we start to question. Where is God? Because it seems like if I believed in God that I believe in, I shouldn't feel the way I feel. And here's the tragedy. Some of you know someone, and some of you, this is your story, that you have walked away from God. Because you couldn't reconcile the truth of God with how you felt. And you thought, 
If I feel that way, the Spirit of God must not be inside of me. Because it seems like the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And right now, all I feel is depression. So you wander away. You think, is it real? Is it true? I want you to just, for the next few minutes, examine with me what David says. Because as he, or not David, I'm sorry, the psalmist says, because as the psalmist writes this, he begins to hold what we would call a cognitive dissonance. A cognitive dissonance, which which means I believe this, but I feel this. There's a dissonance between what I think to be true and what I do, but what I think to be true and what I feel. There is a cognitive dissonance. Let me tell you, inside of each one of us, there can be a cognitive dissonance between what I feel and what I know. Between how I feel about the situation in my life and what I know to be true. And so David, or sorry, I keep saying David because it's Psalms and you get it. Anyways, so if I said David from here on out, just like throw that out the window, okay? Thank you online. I appreciate your patience. Somebody's going to comment like, oh, I'm going to City Church next week. Good. You can just click over right now, okay? So I want, I want you to see how David kind of, see, that's the problem. I want you to see how the psalmist detaches from what he's saying and says, okay, let me just, let me just spell out what's happening internally here. Verse 5, he says, so why are you downcast, O my soul? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will praise him, my Savior, my God. Now, this is interesting because he's talking to himself. He's talking to himself. He says soul. It's almost like he's having this outer body experience, like, like on this side is soul, and this side is what I ought to do. He says soul. Why are you doing that? Like, you know God. You know the truth of God. You know the reality of God. And so why are you so downcast? This is the cognitive dissonance. Looking at himself saying, I know I feel this, but I also know this is true. And so if I know this is true, why do you feel that way? It says, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior, my God. My soul is downcast within me, therefore I will remember you. It says, this is what I'm going to do. God, I'm going to start to remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mazar. He says, deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and your breakers have swept over me. I would love this because this is back and forth, right? He's saying, God, you are my Savior, my God. I'm going to remember you. I'm going to remember my, your faithfulness. Very next verse. God, everything's awful. Deep calls to deep. Every, everything, it just seems like the waves are constantly breaking over my head. Let me ask you this. As just an indicator of our level of our emotional idols, When your waves or when the waves of your life are breaking over your head, whatever those waves are, relational waves, financial waves, familial waves, career waves, school waves, achievement waves, relationships, whatever those waves are, do you ever bring that? in an honest way, to God. More so, do you ever bring it to God in an honest way that's not God fix this, bless this, move in this towards where I don't have to suffer this anymore? Some of us, we pray and we're just saying, God, we pray that God, would you take this, would you take this, would you remove this? I think there's a place for that. But I think that there's much more of a place as we read through the Psalms and the prayers where it's a constant God, I know you're good and I feel like everybody else is winning. God, I know you're good and it feels like the the people who shouldn't win, the people who are evil are seem to consistently triumph over me. God, I know that you're good but it just seems like everything is headed in the wrong direction. Let me tell you what most of us do. Most of us either hide from God 
and medicate with an idol. Or we simply try to use God to make sure we don't feel that way anymore. But isn't this true? That God is big enough to handle your cognitive dissonance. God is big enough to handle that. And, and here's what we find. Here's what we find is when we begin to struggle with that, when we begin to say, okay, God, I feel this way, and I know that to be true. I feel this way, I know that to be true. What we're going to find is that God is honored in that struggle. And when God is honored, we grow closer. Here's how it continues. Verse 7, going back, he says, Deep calls to deep, and the roar of your waterfalls, all your waves, your breakers have swept over me. By day, he says, by day, this is how I feel. The Lord directs his love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. He says, man, by day, I just sometimes I just feel this, this sense of closeness, this sense of oneness with God. That at night his song is with me, a prayer to God of my life. <laughs> Verse 9, other side of the spectrum. I say to God, my rock. So God, you are my rock. God, I know that's true. God, I, I am fully and finally and firmly convinced that you are my rock. Yet at the same time, my rock, here's what I say to you. Verse 9, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? He says, God, and I feel like in light of all of that, I know that to be true, and I feel like you've forgotten me. I mean, come on, what is the power in that? How honest and raw and real is that? I love it. Because most times in a prayer life, isn't this true? That, that we will go to God and we'll just say, God, okay, here's a couple things, and here's somebody who's sick, and here's some stuff that's going on. God, help me to be better, follow you more, and sin less. Help me to not be tempted by that anymore, perhaps. How many of us have gone to God and said, God, I just got to be honest. I know that you're good. So that's not a question in my life. I am anchored in that reality. Yet, God, I feel this thing inside of me that wants to say that you have left me. Let me tell you this. Very few of us, very few of us have ever gotten to that point. But if we ever did, we would experience an intimacy with God that we perhaps have never had before. Here's the reality. When you are intimate and honest with somebody, and when you are transparent with them, isn't it true that intimacy grows? This is why for those of you who you've had sin in your life, or, you, well, you've had, like, you're holy and you don't ever have sin in your life right now, right? But, you know, in the past you used to have sin. No, when you've had something in your life that you're like, I need to confess this, I need to confess this, I need to confess this, and finally you talk to somebody, you say, hey, I've had a thing that I have been struggling with and I need to tell somebody about it. And when you tell somebody about that, when you are honest with where you are, when you are transparent with where you are, isn't this true? There is a connection that develops in that. That you all of a sudden feel a sense of closeness, togetherness, intimacy, And when we go to God, instead of medicating our emotions, then intimacy begins to flourish as God is honored with this struggle. He says, my bones suffer mortal agony as my foes taunt me, saying to me all day long, where is your God. So why are you so downcast on my soul? Why are you disturbed within me? He says, put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. You want to know one of my favorite things about this? Is he has an ending point. He has a conclusion but his conclusion is not a sense of a resolution. It's not the sense that I figured it out. The psalm ends by him saying, man, I feel this way. I feel this way. And so why are you so downcast, my soul? Why do you, why, like, like, it's almost like he's saying soul. Soul, let me talk to you for a second. Soul, why do you feel this way? I mean, this is ridiculous that you feel this way because you know this to be true. That I know that I will put my, my hope, my trust in my God. And then he just ends. 
<laughs> he didn't say, <clears throat> and then I came to the realization, and all of a sudden the cognitive dissonance just kind of dissipated, and all of a sudden there was a sense of reconciliation. I was just good inside from now on because I realized soul, and my soul realized, oh, you know, third-party person that's speaking to myself in a weird kind of way. You know, you're right. Let me just put my hope in God, so now my hope's in God, so now I feel good. The difficult thing for some of us is when we read that, we think, man, I want to have resolution. But the reason I think, the reason I think this is so important is because it has very little to do with the resolution you feel from bringing those two things together. And it has so much to do with God being honored in the process in intimacy growing and flourishing. Let me explain that this way. Emotions are indicators of our heart, but they shouldn't be dictators of our obedience. And the key to that is the struggle. And we don't like struggle. But I think God, in the times where we just know that God, I, I have this, this emotion and it's an indicator of my heart, and I know that to be true. But God, I don't want to let that be the dictator of my obedience to you. And God, I am in a cognitive dissonant battle right now for my heart's and my mind's attention and focus and affection. And so I'm going to struggle with this. And God's saying, I know this is how I feel, and I know this is who you are. And I'm going to struggle with it because I think more than we think, more than we believe, God is honored by the struggle. This morning, well, this weekend, um, I have been suffering for the sake of Christ and that my wife has been out of town all weekend. Okay? And I have two kids. Just pray for me. And you know how it is, you know, they're, they're fun and they're crazy and the house is a disaster and we ate nothing healthy all weekend. They literally both shared a chocolate milkshake for breakfast this morning. I'm like, yeah, they're like, dad, I'm like, yeah, whatever, you know. Um, so this morning we were, you know, on our way here and it's, it, a lot of, the thing that can get difficult for me is, you guys know I have a tendency to be late, crazy. Um, and on top of that, when it's a tendency to be late with two small kids who have no they have no awareness that, like, we're in a rush. Even though I say, hey, we're in a rush, listen to dad, they're like, oh, a butterfly. I'm like, no, come on, come on, come on, let's go, you know. It's go time. i got to be there. I've got hosting. We can't be late. And so I'm talking to my, you know, two kids, like, about Ava and Rose. Ava's five, you know, about to be six, and Ava just, or Rose just turned four. And, and I'm talking to them, and I say, you know, Ava, and she's a little bit older, and she uh, is a little more independent. So I say, Ava, I need you to get your shoes and your socks on. Get your shoes and your socks on. And some of you have heard me talk about my kids in our continual, eternal battle with shoes and socks on in the morning time. They're like, it's like, like, I don't know what it is about them. I think they just don't hear it. They're like, okay, Woo-hoo. you know, it's kind of like us with God when he tells us to do stuff, but that's a different, that's a, that is this sermon. But <clears throat> I'm talking to Ava and I'm saying, I said, I said Ava, you know, get your shoes and your socks. Um, I said, Brody, get your shoes and your socks. So he brings his shoes. He doesn't wear socks. His feet smell atrocious because of it. And Ava is responsible. And so she goes and she gets her shoes and she can only find one sock. And we're, you know, under the gun, and so I'm saying, come on, we got to go, we got to go. I'm getting all the everything else ready, making sure we're good to go. Well, Ava brings in two shoes, one sock. And I say, okay, here's what you're going to do. I want you to put on one shoe, one sock, and then I want you to go find the other sock. She says, okay, Dad, I'm going. It's like, thank you, my one obedient child. And so she goes, and she's trying to find her sock. She's looking for her sock. She can't find her sock anywhere. She comes back, and she says, Dad, I can't find the sock. I said, Ava, just keep looking. Have you looked here? Yep, look there. Have you looked there? Nope, haven't looked there. Go look there. She says, okay, I'm going to look for the sock. I'm going to look for the sock. She goes all around. Eventually, she comes back and she says, Dad, I can't find the sock. Now, this sounds like it's a long time. This is about 45-second increments for those of you who have kids because you know they don't really, like, look, look. They just, like, oh, I don't see it, you know? <laughs> so as I'm talking to her, <clears throat> I look and I say, and I say, Ava, I don't care. I just want you to look. That's all. I just want you to look. She says, okay. So she keeps looking and keeps looking, and, and I get, you know, everything ready to pray. I say, okay, Ava, let's find, find the sock. So I go and I find the sock for her, put the sock on her little foot. Um, and, and I couldn't help but think of this because Ava never found the sock. And when she came back to me and said, Dad, 
in her little five-year-old version, I have been looking for this sock, and I can't find this sock. I knew, because I heard her walk around. I knew where she was going around the house. I heard her walk up the steps. I heard her kind of go into the laundry room. I heard her go into all these places, right? I heard her looking and searching for this sock. And when she came back to me and said, Dad, I couldn't find the sock. I knew that she says, Dad, this is what I want to do. And I struggle to do it, but I haven't completed it yet. I didn't say, are you kidding me? Out of the house, you know? No dinner, because you couldn't find a sock. Get out of here, you five-year-old, right? Grow up. Come back when your mama comes home. No. I'm honored that she tried. I am honored, as her father, that she struggled for me. It wasn't perfect. She didn't execute the task. She didn't get the mission right. But I, as her father, am honored at her struggle for me. And let me tell you, there is a sense of connection and intimacy that's built. There is a sense of trust that is built between me and her when I see her honoring and trying and struggling for me. She wasn't perfect. She didn't get it right. She didn't complete the admission. But I care that she struggled. The reason why... While going to God in prayer, when we don't feel it, the reason why, going, why, why not saying, okay, God, I'm going to let my emotions be an indicator of my heart, and I'm just simply going to medicate my heart with whatever's around me. There's no struggle in that. There's no attempt in that. But when I go to God and I say, God, I know, I know that you're good. And I know that you're good more than the psalmist knew that you were good. Because I know that you're good in light of the cross. I know that you are good because, God, you know me and my sinfulness, you and your holiness. And you know that we are incompatible because of your holiness and my sinfulness. And you and I know that you sent your son, that I couldn't make myself right with you because at the core I am still sinful. And you are holy and pure. You are almighty God. I cannot be in your presence. And you knew that you sent your son to die for me so that I can have salvation, eternity with you. And God, I don't don't try to be obedient for you to make you happy with me. God, you are already happy with me, and so I'm trying to be obedient for you. But God, sometimes in the fact that I know that you are delighted in me, therefore I live for you. You're happy with me, therefore I live for you. God, sometimes in light of that, I still want to do my own thing, go my own way, feel my own feelings, and turn them from you and run and hide. But God, I am choosing to bring them to you because I know you're true. I know that you're my rock. I know that you are holy. And let me just tell you, God is honored by the struggle. Because if you were a parent, wouldn't you be? Mother's Day, Father's Day comes around, and you're a parent, and your kid brings you the breakfast they tried to cook, and the bacon is like a third cooked, right? Register sausage, it's good to go regardless. You know, you've got eggs, you've got all this kind of stuff, right? And they bring it to you, and there's, there's shells, and nothing's really going to cook that, that well. You're not going to be like, are you kidding me? Get that out of my face. You know, you sinner. <laughs> or if you're a Baptist, you backslider, you know. Shout out. No, you're honored. You're honored. At the struggle. So here's what I want to invite you to do. What you need to know is that our emotions are an indicator, but they are not the dictator of our obedience. What do you need to do? You need to honor God by struggling in prayer. You need to honor God by struggling in prayer. Say, God, I feel deep down inside like I'm overwhelmed and like you have forgotten me, and like everything is going wrong. And I know this is true, and I am in this dissonant middle ground. And today, I might not get to a resolution. And so today, I just want to say to you, God, I just want to say to my soul, soul, believe in God. Put your hope in God. And soul, I know you're not there yet, but we're going to get there. We're going to struggle for it, and we're going to get there. And here's what I promise. When you feel that, feel And you're able to go to God in prayer and say, God, this is how I feel, but yet I know you're true. God is honored in the struggle, and I promise you will honor God in your struggle. And you will grow in your intimacy with God in your relationship. 
You will honor God with your struggle, and you will grow in intimacy as you have the audacity to be honest. So here's my hope in this whole series. That we don't simply try to say, okay, so don't feel emotions anymore. Don't feel the need for success anymore. Don't feel the need for the relationships anymore. We just say, God, I feel this internal struggle. I feel this emotion. Help me to understand that it is an indicating something, but I'm not going to medicate it. I'm simply going to bring it to you and say, God, I am struggling. I am struggling. God, day after day, I am struggling. This week, I am struggling. This month, I am struggling. This year, I am struggling. And God, I'm going to continue to bring this struggle to you, and I'm going to continue to struggle with it because I want to honor you with this struggle as long as it takes. And let me tell you, you will develop the most intimate relationship with God. That when you pray and you're honest with God, it doesn't feel like your prayers are just bouncing off the walls, but that you're speaking to your heavenly Father who so loves you, he sent his son to die for you. Let's pray together. God, please help us to not be a people who have our emotions as our dictator. Help them to be an indicator, but not a dictator. An indicator of where our heart is, an indicator of where our mind is, but not a dictator of our obedience and our affections towards you. God, help us to honor you with the struggle. Help us to honor you with the struggle for obedience. Help us to honor you as we're all like these little five and six-year-old kids that are just looking for the sock, that are just cooking our dad breakfast. Not because our dad says you have to do this in order for me to love you, but because we love you, we trust you, we know you. But deep down, we have an internal, spiritual, cognitive, emotional dissonance. And I pray as we bring that to you day after day, after day, day after day after day. And we're just honest and say, God, I know this to be true, and yet I feel this way. Would you be honored in the struggle? Would you help our holiness to grow in our intimacy with you to be present? Because we know that you are good. We know that you are true. Help us to go to you every day in prayer, battling and fighting to honor you. And it's in your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen.